<clears throat> all right. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone to Agile Coaching Roundtable. So today is our uh, second session, guest speaker session, and uh, we have uh, Zishan as our uh, Amjad as our guest speaker, and uh, to just uh, talk about Zishan, uh, I uh, happen to just uh, come across Zishan's uh, profile because of some of the uh, old uh, kind of a video that I had done on the estimations and. Uh, Zishan kind of corrected me in uh, some places. That's how I got to know about Zishan. And uh, after then, uh, it just took off and uh, we started uh, interacting a lot. And uh, there is a lot of learning that I have uh, learned from uh, Zishan. To just tell you all, Z uh, Zishan is an author, uh, is a co-author. And uh, I mean, his art, uh, he has written many, many articles on uh, Agile. And his articles are published as well. He his presence is on everywhere. He's uh, he's on uh, Medium. He's on LinkedIn. And if I have to talk about his uh, achievements or certifications, I would need an entire session to just talk about his certifications. He has done all the certifications uh, from Scrum.org. You name it, and he has done it. He has done all the certifications. If you just happen to check his uh, uh, LinkedIn profile, check his about section. I don't think anyone would have such a big uh, about section uh, on LinkedIn. I mean, he is a very learned person and uh, and very humble. And uh, you will learn a lot uh, from him today. At least uh, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot. Uh, on that note, I think uh, Zishan, uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Ramaya. Uh, so nice of you, uh, such a kind words. Uh... I'm very humble and thankful for such a great introduction. And um, it's a mutual journey. Learning is mutual from both of us and all of us. And uh, today's session, uh, I invited all of you uh, to join with me for uh, this session and uh, have our journey together. So let me know when you are able to see my. Yes, we are able to. Yes, we are able to. Zishan, you are not uh, audible. I think your video is also frozen. Okay, he is joining us back. Uh, some technical issue uh, with his uh, system, so you will be joining us uh, in few minutes. Okay, so uh, in meantime, I would just like to uh, inform uh, everyone is that uh, it would be. I am assuming that it would be like uh, thirty to forty-five minutes of his uh, session, and followed by uh, Q and A. Uh, and uh, Zishan would, uh, is joining us from uh, the US and uh, the current uh, time over there is like 1.30 a.m. So I would uh, request everyone to keep your questions uh, ready or uh, I mean whatever you want to ask and uh, let's not uh, hold on much uh, because uh, I mean obviously it would be like 2.30 uh, a.m. Uh, as we finish this uh, session for him. So I mean I would uh, request everyone to, I mean, uh, let uh, let him complete the session first, and then we would take up the uh, Q and A. Uh, and as I mentioned, he we are going to learn a lot from him. His uh, his contribution to uh, agile community is immense. I mean, he, uh, he not only uh, works as an uh, agile coach or maybe in the agile uh, 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 community or uh, the background. He also uh, works on uh, as your side as well. So whatever you feel that you want to uh, get the clarification on uh, related to the topic, uh, definitely um, you can uh, get that clarified today.
Yes, we have Zishan back. Interesting. This was not a plant thing, but interestingly, yes. we did the agile thing. So that's actually <laughs> happens. Unexpected thing happened. So no problem. And we did dry run as well, and we did not face this issue. Yeah, <laughs> we did not face this issue. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I think uh, you can get started, Zishan. Yes, now I'm opening the presentation again. And sharing my screen. Let me know when you are able to see my screen. Yes, we are able to. Great. OK, so uh, today's session is uh, one of the uh, very uh, demanding session about the metrics because I know everyone loves to talk about the metrics. And I'm sure that all of you face uh, this question sometimes in your career and feel free to share your experiences. So if we are going to have it uh, a two way conversation, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, it looks like that uh, it's a monologue and I'm talking to the laptop. And believe me, it is not a great feeling to talk to the laptop. So we are going to discuss uh, one uh, patterns or uh, one uh, matrix which is very common nowadays I observe and that is a uh, plan versus completed the things. And when you are going to ask uh, why someone actually is interested in this matrix. So usually we are getting the response something like this that our end result, our end goal is try to make our velocity predictable. And uh, and more than once I came, actually came across this conversation that uh, they were saying, OK, we are not asking you to increase the velocity. We are not trying to compare the velocity of one team with another team, but we are actually interested to see that whatever you plan and whatever you complete it. So we are very much predictable and we can make the future plan accordingly. So this is what usually something similar you came across. Maybe you heard these type of stories. But let's try to understand what does it mean? If we are trying to make the velocity predictable. Velocity is not equal to value. Higher the velocity does not mean that we are providing high value to the stakeholders. We may or we may not. There is no direct correlation. How many times we came across a situation when we actually release the new feature or just take a look at the reverse way? How many times we came across a situation when the new version of the website or the software released and you don't like it because the things are not exactly the same place where it used to be before? It becomes a little bit difficult or become maybe a different workflow to achieve the same thing. What does it mean? It means that it is not the same value to you. So the releasing of the new feature may or may not be a value, maybe a negative value. So this is first important concept that velocity is not equal to value. Then what the velocity is? Velocity is actually the effort. We are trying to quantify the effort whatever the effort we are going to do in this particular sprint. And making the velocity predictable means that we are trying to make our effort predictable. And what does it mean by making the effort predictable? It means that we are trying to make sure that our plan is predictable. So if our, is, our plan is predictable, if we can plan everything correctly, then maybe we have to ask ourselves, is it really a complex domain problem? Is this really an agile needed here? But since we are not going to in that particular route, we are not discussing the complexity theory and all that thing in detail. Let's focus on this particular metrics because our today's topic is more about the metrics. And here we are discussing the metrics. Plan versus completed. So initially I'm trying to set the stage. And after that, I'm going to introduce the 12 anti patterns. That maybe arise when someone is trying to achieve this matrix. So now let's have a little bit question. 
now my questions are what if we discovered something new during the sprint? What are we supposed to do in that case? Are we supposed to update our plan? If we discover something new, it can be positive or negative. We might came across a situation where the things might become more difficult than what we anticipated earlier, or maybe easier than what we anticipated earlier. What are we supposed to do? We might discover some external dependencies, which were not, with which we were not aware earlier. If we are not updating the plan in that case, then what is going to happen? If we stick to our plan, then how this is different than what we used to do in a waterfall approach? And if we actually update the plan, but we are not updating our sprint backlog, then how do we make our sprint backlog transparent? Because we are doing something, updated plan, but that updated plan is not reflected in a sprint backlog. So plan versus completed, it means that we are trying to stick with the original plan, even if there is a need for doing the inspection and adaptation. Even during the sprint, we are doing inspect and adopt. Daily Scrum is one of the opportunity, one of the formal opportunity of doing the inspect and adopt. And we came across something during the inspection and we need to adjust our plan. But either we refuse to do it or either we are trying to stick with the original plan or either we adopt the plan, we change the plan, but we are not making it transparent. So these are the important questions to think whenever we are trying to think about the predictability of the velocity. Now let's discuss something outside of the Agile domain or outside of the Scrum domain. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me whenever you want. So it is not a single conversation. It is you are not a mute. You are not muted. Uh, feel free to chat. Feel free to speak. So this is a person who wrote the book The Goal, Ally and Goldratt. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Uh, he wrote the, introduced the concept of theory of constraint and wrote a very good book, The Goal, The Phoenix Project, which most of you are already familiar, uh, is actually inspired by uh, the work of this author, The Goal. And he actually wrote a very interesting sentence in this book, The Haystake Syndrome. Tell me how you measure me and I will tell you how I will behave. If you measure me in illogical way, then do not complain about the illogical behavior. And how many times we came across this situation? We are trying to measure some teams or some individuals, and whatever the way we decided to measure, the teams started behaving like this. It is equally applicable to us. The way someone else is measuring us, then we are trying to change our behavior accordingly. And what does it mean? This is actually called the Hawthorne effect. What does it mean, Hawthorne effect? What is the Hawthorne effect? Individuals modify their behavior to obtain a favorable perception when they are under the pressure of being observed. If you are not observing the people for some specific criteria, then they are behaving differently. But if you tell them that you are going to be judged by this particular behavior, for example, I used to have a very simple example uh, even in my job that, for example, if I judge you that how late you are in this meeting, and even if you are late only 30 seconds in the meeting, then it is going to impact your annual review and people will change their behavior and they were trying to get on time on this on this meeting because they are being observed for that particular criteria. So this is important for all metrics that whatever we are decided, people are going to change their behavior to get the favorable reception. 
This is called the Hawthorne effect. Let's introduce one more concept. So first I am introducing this concept in a journal form, original form it is introduced and then after that I'm going to introduce a simplified version of this. So Charles Goodhart, they explain this concept and the concept is any observed statistical regularity will tends to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purpose. I know it is difficult to understand, so let's take a look at the simplified version of this. And what is the simplified version of this? So Marlin Stratton said the simplified version that when measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. What does it mean? It means we decided we, we are trying to measure something and most of the time we came across a reason that we are measuring because we want to improve. And so many times we came across the sentences like this. If we cannot measure, we cannot improve. Yes, if we are measuring for the improvement point of view, yes, I understand that thing. But if we are measuring in such a way that we want to get some target, if we made the measure as a target, then people are trying to game that system in such a way that you will get whatever you want to get. And as a result of that, you will get the numbers, the data, the dashboard, the tables, the graphs, all the tabular forms, but it is not showing the reality. And as a result of that, it is no more a good measure. It ceased to be a good measure. During my experiences of working in a different organizations and different clients, I actually observed 12 different anti patterns when we are trying to achieve plan versus completed. And maybe some of you already saw something similar. And I'm not claiming that these are the only 12 anti patterns happen. And I'm not claiming that this is definitely going to happen. There may be more than this. And there may be possibility that none of this is happening. The way I am actually explaining this thing. In my job with my clients, during my writings, during my speaking is. We have to watch on these patterns if this thing is happening or not. So let's start with those anti patterns one by one and see if you can spot any of these anti patterns. And feel free to speak. So yeah, we saw something like this. So this is one possible situations. Teams intentionally put the less pull the less work than whatever their capacity is to make their data looks good at the end of the sprint. And what is actually happening when the teams are doing this thing? Because of this thing, their sprint planning is no more transparent. Because they can pull X amount of work, but they are doing less than X amount of work. So at the end of the sprint, they can show that they completed that much percent of plan versus completed. But their sprint planning is no more transparent. And if transparency is broken, then we cannot do inspect and top. Our empiricism is no more working. Not only that, if you are discussing with respect to the scrum, then it also means that the team is not showing the scrum value of courage. The team is not showing the scrum value of openness. And the team is not even respecting the stakeholders, the product owners. They can do more, but just to make their data looks good, they are pulling the less work, so they will not get blamed at the end of the sprint. Everything looks good. Maybe some of you already observed something similar. Let's take a look at one more. Team focus more on the product backlog items, or most of the times people used to call it stories, than the sprint goal. And sometimes they even don't have a sprint goal. And what is happening if they don't have a sprint goal? Then there is no focus, there is no commitment, and there is no respect for the stakeholders. The teams only cares about if we can get X amount of stories done, so our reports looks good. 
whether that X amount of a story is helping to achieve the sprint goal or not helping to achieve the sprint goal, or maybe they don't have a sprint goal at all. So the focus shifts from a sprint goal to the stories and PPIs. Teams focus more on the story points, stories, velocities, PBIs, than providing the value to the stakeholders. How many times you came across a situation when the main focus of the team is if we can get that much amount of work is done, so we will not get penalized. Rather than the focus is if this particular thing is providing the value to the stakeholder or not. So again, the focus is shifted. The team changes their behavior. Someone say something? Okay. So let's take a look at one more. Team marks their product backlog items or a story complete to make their data looks good, although it is not done as per the definition of done. I saw this behavior when the whole team, even the product owner said, okay, just mark it complete. And whatever the remaining work is, we will do in the next sprint. And sometimes they actually does in the next sprint, and sometimes they will never get an opportunity to do in the next sprint because they were pulled to do something else. But what is happening if they mark the thing as a done, although it is not meeting the definition of done? The definition of done is a commitment of the increment, and when we are not meeting the definition of done, our increment is no more transparent. So whenever we are breaking the transparency, our empiricism is not going to work. So again, probably you will see this pattern again and again, that one way or another way, most of the times we are either breaking the transparency or focusing on the data rather than on creating the value for the stakeholders. Let's take a look at one more. Teams inflate the estimation and adding the buffer to avoid having the bad sprint data. Just to give you an example, maybe the teams has a consensus that this thing is a two story point or a three story point, but as a safe side, they just make it five and not only for the safe side, but they are doing it because their data and data will looks good. So they are going to be in such a situation that they completed that much story points. So they pulled the 20 or 40 or whatever the number is, and they were able to complete 90% of that, whatever they pull, 95% of that. And what is happening here? Now their estimation is no more transparent because estimation is supposed to be X, but now they inflate the thing and it becomes Y. And just a side story related to this one that is not directly related to plan versus completed. It's actually happened in one of the organization, one of the client, when one of their OKR was increase the velocity of the teams 50, 15% by the end of the uh, end of calendar year. And when I came to this particular OKR, I was saying, why should I wait for the end of the year? I can do it in a very next sprint. Just inflate the estimation. The team will do very similar to this thing because increasing the velocity of 15% means nothing if we are not pro providing the value to the stakeholders. Team will just try to game the numbers. If they know their annual increment, if they know their performance review, if they know their contract renewal, it depends on this AK OKR, it depends on this particular matrix, then they will try to, they will definitely try to game the numbers. They will change their behavior. As we discussed at the beginning, Hawthorne effect. People are trying to change their behavior to get the favorable perception. That is not a reality, that is a perception. The numbers look good. The person who are reading the report or asking the report might be thinking they are doing extra work. They improve, but in reality, it is just a perception, just a non-transparent estimation. Team works extra hour 
sometimes over the weekend to complete the work to make their data looks good. So sometimes they are not trying to play with the uh, number game. Sometimes they actually do the extra hours work. So they have some things to complete and they were working extra hours and weekends and extra spend some time to complete to look the numbers good. But how many times they are able to do this thing? Is it sustainable? Can they do it with a sustainable pace forever? It is not sustainable. Teams cannot do this thing again and again. Not only that. Again, this time our estimation is no more transparent. Because estimation is saying this is X amount of work, but in reality teams are doing more than X amount of work. So again, we are breaking the transparency here. Estimation is no more transparent. Teams create some stories, usually in the technical depths, design and spike, only to claim them done at the end of the sprint. So their data looks good. I came across one situation when teams reserve 20% of the capacity in such a way that they created some story and they will use whatever the names spike or design or technical depth or sometimes even the KTLO. The story is just a KTLO. And even though if they are not working a single second on those tickets at the end of the sprint, they just mark it close. So at least they have the confidence that if everything goes wrong, is still 20% of the plan versus completed they will achieve or whatever the percent they decided. Now in that particular example, I saw they, they decided the 20%, but some teams can decide the different number. So they just created something in the sprint backlog, which whether they do anything or they do not do anything, they just close at the end of the sprint. Yeah, we completed that many story points. So our report looks good. Teams first complete the work and then pull the sprint backlog. So they want to make sure that they will get the credit at the end of the sprint. Because they don't want to have that fear that if we pull the work, then maybe we will be able to do it. Maybe we will not be able to do it. So they, just, they first finish the work. And after finishing the work, then they pull the sprint backlog. So here, what are they doing in the sprint planning? Their sprint planning is no more transparent. It is just they are trying to get their data looks good. Individuals in the teams inclined to pick the product backlog item or stories, they do have more expertise to make their data looks good at the end of the sprint. So some people might have an expertise on some specific area, Although the product owner prioritize or sequence the PBIs in the value that the highest value should be at the top, but they tends to pick up the things which they are com comfortable or they have expertise and they are having the negotiation with the product owner. And the whole point of negotiation is they should be able to pull only those stories or at least maximum number of those stories where they do have an expertise. So here the focus is not on the value creation, the maximizing the value for the stakeholder. The focus is what, how I can make my data looks good. So I'm going to pull only those type of work or majority of those type of work where I already have an expertise. So what is happening as a result of that? It is creating a silos. The local optimization. And it is also creating a lack of focus. Are they working as a team in this particular situation? If the PBI or story is partially completed, what the team is doing, the team is split into the two and mark one is a complete to claim the partial credit. So their data looks good. What is happening? For example, if the story is five point story or eight point stories and they did some work, but they are not able to finish it. What they did, they break that story into the two. 
okay, how much work we completed? We completed almost half of the work, little over the half of the work. Okay, so this mark this story as a five, remaining story as a three. So five story is done, three story moved to the next sprint. So at least we will get the five story point. We can claim the five story points done. So what is happening in this particular situation? That particular story is not completed. As per the definition of done, they just is split. They just do it for claiming the partial credit to make their data looks good. Their increment is not transparent. And since it is not even completed, how can we get the feedback on the increment? How can we do the inspect and adopt, inspection and adaptation? Suppose even if they finish it into the next sprint, but what is happening? The partially completed story, which is included in the increment, not only breaking the transparency of the increment, but we cannot even get the feedback from the customer, from, from the stakeholders to the inspect and adopt. So inspection and adaptation of the increment is suffering. Teams introduce some stories as a maintenance or similar work every sprint and mark it complete at the end of the sprint to make their data looks good. To reduce the transparency, I think I discussed this thing uh, earlier where I was discussing another anti pattern when the teams introduce some buffer stories, the spike stories. And here and at that time I discussed about the KTLO. So the team introduced some maintenance story where in one of the experience I saw the teams created 20% of the maintenance stories every sprint, regardless of what else they are doing. And no matter what they are doing with that maintenance thing, they just mark it close. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I guess uh, Roita had a question to sure. ask. Sure. Uh, Roita, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry for that interruption, Zeeshan. Okay. Because uh, yeah, we were going ahead, so I didn't want an old question to interrupt your some new slides of yours. <coughs> you want okay. me to go back? Uh, and no, 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 it's okay. No, not at all, not at all. Uh, so, Mike, since we have been discussing a lot on estimation, this word has been repeating almost every other, um, you know, topic that is being uh, introduced or discussed out here. Uh, and we, I mean, as Scrum Masters uh, of late, there has been a new learning, uh, you know, that estimation, uh, to base your estimation on the real data um, is not the right way and the right, uh, and not the right environment to create uh, to effectively use Scrum or Agile. So having said that, uh, we are so used to, you know, uh, bringing everything uh, in terms of story points, you know, whenever estimation is talked about. So I recently came across a very interesting post saying that um, we should start using more reliable and probabilistic forecasting, you know, uh, when it comes to estimations. So it really didn't, I mean, um, I couldn't really... Uh, you know, elaborate on what it is meant by, you know, probabilistic forecasting. Uh, so if you could share some light and if you could share some other ways of interestingly or, uh, you know, accurately bringing up these predictions on how much is the capacity or how much is the team, you know, uh, I mean, if we want to really put estimation in the right way. So uh, since you're an expert in this field, if you could share some light on that aspect. Uh, thank you for uh, asking this question. So uh, let's take a look at from another way. Uh, in which city you are? Um, I'm an Indian citizen, but residing no, in, in Singapore. City? No, no, in which city you are? Uh, whatever the citizenship is, I'm asking in which city you are right now. Singapore. I stay Singapore. in Singapore. Singapore. Okay, Singapore. Okay, uh, can you tell me what is the weather tomorrow for Singapore? Uh, we have almost the same weather throughout the year, equatorial region, so humid, warm. Okay, so can you tell me uh, what is the weather one week from now? I would say more or less the same. Okay, so I have never been into the Singapore. Maybe, as you said, the weather is going to be almost I the same in Singapore. Question, if, like, can you predict, you know, uh, how would it be one week, if assuming it has a constantly changing weather? Supposingly, if the subcontinent, take a look at the subcontinent, any city in the subcontinent. Take a look at how we are predicting the weather. We are, have you ever seen the weather news that there is definitely going to be rain tomorrow? 
Hmm. Yeah. We are having the conversation. There is a 90% chance of rain. There is a 70% chance of rain. Something like that. And it's becoming more and more accurate if it is closer in the time frame. We will be able to tell the weather of tomorrow with more certainty as compared to weather of one week or one month or six months. Yeah. So take a look at the same logic here, the same concept here. We should be able to provide the estimation with more accuracy with the recent time frame, with the shorter time frame. Obviously, it is a, still a forecast. It is not a commitment, it is a forecast. We are forecasting that what we are supposed to do based on what we did in past. But we may or may not be able to do that because this is just a forecast. Our commitment is a sprint goal. And if we are going far into the horizon, if we are using the same is, is scrum and is sprint term, uh, vocabulary and terms, that how certain we are three sprint from now, five sprint from now, 10 sprint from now. We are not so much sure. And we are going to use the forecasting that we based on our past performance. This is what we forecast that we should be able to do. And if I am going in a little bit more detail, then it is not only about the forecast. There is one more thing which sometimes teams are actually not uh, considering that one is a definition of done. So whatever we are forecasting, the definition of done is a really important thing for our forecasting. But our definition of done is not static. We are improving our definition of done also. Let me give you some concrete example. Previously, we have a simple definition of done, just a standard definition of done. And based on that definition of done, let's suppose our team is most likely able to complete 20 story points. But during the retrospective, the team decided that they are going to improve the definition of turn. And now the definition in the definition of done, they are going to introduce that the team is supposed to have the 70% unit test coverage. But this improved definition of done is definitely going to impact what they are most likely going to be done in the future sprints. What do you think? Are they able to achieve? If Even if the everything is equal, just for the sake of argument, assume everything is equal. Now, with the improved definition of turn, do you think they are able to do exactly the same amount of work? I, I'm focusing on the amount of work. I'm not focusing on the value creation. Do you think are they able to do the same amount of work in the future sprint? I don't think so. Exactly. Probably they will going to pull the less amount of work. So anyway, that was a little bit side conversation for with respect to the definition of done. But the point is that this is a forecast and we are trying to forecast with whatever information we have right now and in a shorter time frame, just like a weather. Whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a tsunami, whether it's a rain, whether it's a tornado, the closer the time frame, we can forecast this better, but longer the time frame, there are more uncertainties. Did I answer your question? Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we discussed this particular anti patterns. Let's see what else. So the teams breaks the product backlog items or the stories pretty much like this is a design story, this is an implement story, this is a test stories, and so on. And the purpose of doing this thing is because they can actually claim some credit. The design is done, okay, this is story is done, claim that credit. Implement is done, okay, they can take that credit. Isn't it something like a mini waterfall with no inspection and adaptation? And even worse, if they are doing it in across the different sprints, just imagine one sprint they are doing design and implement. 
another sprint they are doing test, another sprint they are doing release, then how they are going to do the inspect and adopt? It is something very similar to creating a waterfall, actually creating a mini waterfall, waterfalls inside the sprint or waterfall that is span in the multiple sprints. This is actually the last entry pattern, the 12th entry pattern. Now I'm going to mention a very interesting sentence written in this book. And if anyone of you want to become a really good product owner, I highly recommend this book. If you punish the bad news, you will only get the good news. Even worse, more accurately, the camouflage bad news made to look good. And this is directly related to what we discussed at the beginning, Hawthorne effect. The people change their behavior. And if we are punishing the people on the bad news, then they will change their behavior and they will not give the bad news to you. And even if there is a bad news, they will camouflage that bad news to the good news. Before the ending the session, I'm going to tell you one story. Approximately 150 years or somewhere 150 to 200 years old story. And that story is around the New Delhi. So what happened around that time during the British India before the partition? New Delhi, there was a lot of snakes, a lot of cobras were there. And the British government wanted to get rid of the cobras. cobras. So what they did, they introduced the bounty that whoever is giving the cobra to the government, they will get some bounty some price, some money or something like that. So the main intention is that they will get rid of the Cobra around the vicinity of the New Delhi. What is happening as a result of that? People start breeding the Cobras. And they will have more and more Cobras so they can give it to the government and they can get more and more bounties. Pretty much like a side business. And one day, government discovered this thing. And what the government did, they stopped the bounties. What is happening after that? So all of the cobras, if the peoples are breeding, all of a sudden, they become a useless. They don't know what to do with that cobras because they cannot get the bounties. And what they did, they just released those cobras. And what happened as a result of that? Although the intention was good, intention was to reduce the population of Cobra around the Delhi area. But what happened? They actually ended up increasing the population of the Cobra. And that is why it is called the Cobra effect. Cobra effect is the unintended negative consequences of incentive that was designed to improve the society or individual's well-being. So whenever we are going to introduce the matrix, although our intentions are really good, yes, we want to improve the system. Yes, we want to improve the product. We want to improve the quality. We want to improve this thing or that thing. We have to be really careful because of the Hawthorne effect, because of the good heart law. That is there going to be unintended negative consequences we, can, we might face that instead of improving the society or individuals or well beings or teams or organization, we are actually making it worse? Just like what happened during the New Delhi uh, approximately 150 years ago. Instead of reducing the Cobra, they actually increased the Cobra. So if we are trying to make it predictable, are we really going to make it predictable? Or are we going to release the low quality product to the customer? Or are we going to just have a good numbers? Have a watermelon effect. Everything is green from the top, but red from the inside. So that's it pretty much for now. I just want to focus on one matrix, but it is such an interesting topic that we can discuss a lot of things related to the other matrix and matrix in journal that how can we create a matrix that is going to be improve the system that is going to help us. 
that's it from my side now. Any question or any anything else any one of you want? Thank you, Nishan, uh, for the wonderful uh, session. And it was really uh, informative and insightful. Uh, and I think we can uh, open up for the questions. And as I mentioned, guys, uh, so it's too late for him, so we'll not hold uh, Zishan much. So if you guys have any questions or you want to uh, clarify anything, uh, you can please go ahead. No question. My teacher used to tell me that if there is no question, then there are only two possibilities. Either you understand everything or nothing. I hope it is the first case. Uh, Zishan Vivek, yeah. I so I have a question. I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm working as a scrum. Is it only me who is not, not able to hear properly? No, no, she is not audible. Okay, maybe Vivek, you can uh, go with your question first. Yeah. Then. Yeah. So, uh, Zishan, I mean, uh, uh, though we every time, uh, you know, uh, understand what those anti patterns are and how, uh, but my my concern here is like how. You know, uh, how do we get rid of this anti pattern? Though we understand that this is an anti pattern, we always need to focus on an empirical process and all those stuff. We always need to inspect, adapt, and you know, uh, have the transparency uh, built within the system. Uh, but then uh, the other side is like uh, one is like we need we we always interact with multiple people. When I say multiple people, is like uh, the stakeholders, the client, the leadership, and everything. And most of them at the leadership level, they focus on. Uh, some or the other metrics to you know validate how the team is progressing. Uh, so that usually becomes a very difficult thing to manage or to handle in a situation where uh, eventually, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, you know people get into that system of uh, the forging data. How, how do we how do we manage that? Sure. Uh, usually, I have a very simple question. I can ask the same question with all of you. Any one of you can answer. So. I am very much sure that all of you have an experience of shopping, whether online or in person or whatever it is. Tell me the last time you bought something because it was built using the Scrum. Have you ever bought anything because they use the Scrum to build that product? Or Kanban, or Safe, or Less, or Lean, or XP? Or TPS or anything like that. We we are never. Zishan, this is something you never even thought about it. <laughs> we never bought so the product basically. because of the process. We bought the product because of the value it is giving oh, to yeah. us. When we are going to the store to buy something, we saw whether it is a valuable to us or not. Whether it is uh, whatever I am investing, I, am I supposed to get the return of investment? So we are getting the things based on the value. So for the leadership, I want to have the conversation based on the value and I ask them that this question and I ask them another follow up question that, OK, if you are a customer of your own team, what does this mean to you? Vivek, did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I got your uh, answer, Zishan. I mean, uh, Though I understand uh, how the conversation needs to be taken up, uh, but then eventually it's like uh, as as we, as we were discussing a while back before getting into this session, it's by the end of the day, it's like uh, uh, looking into what is more practical or you know uh, looking at that paycheck kind of a thing. So uh, that is where you know uh, eventually we each one of you know we we we. You know, we give it up. Okay, that's you know, if they need it, just just give that or publish that data. So that is what uh, I was just trying to put across. Uh, yes, I came across this particular situation several times in my career, and uh, uh, what we were trying to do as a scrum master or as a coach is, are we just let them the awareness that this is what the current situation is, and we let them the awareness. What is their end goal? What are they trying to achieve? Are they trying to give the value to the stakeholder 
or are they trying to just make the good numbers and the good dashboard? In fact, in one particular organization, I came across one thing when one Scrum master is so much keen about using the Scrum perfectly. What the end customer is going to do if you are doing the Scrum perfectly or not, if you are not, if the customer is not getting the value. Do you care like the laptop you are using right now, the phone you are using right now, they use the Scrum perfectly or not? I even don't know they are using the Scrum or safe or less or all the fancy words. So yes. now let's put this conversation a little bit more forward. So if we are having our metrics, those are value based. Then definitely people are going to change their behavior accordingly, as we saw in the Hawthorne effect, and then their behavior changes are more focused on the value because that's what our metrics are. But if our, if our metrics are more on the effort base, then they will change their behavior for towards the effort. So if our metrics are how soon, how quickly we are able to deliver things to the customer, how satisfied our customer is, how much product they are using, what is the usage index? And there is actually a whole framework, evidence-based management framework that is to discussing exactly the same thing where we are measuring we are trying to measure the value created for the stakeholders. We are not trying to measure the effort. As I'm going to repeat myself, if I'm measuring that how often you are on time in the meeting, then you will change your behavior to be on time. Whatever I'm going to measure, you will change your behavior accordingly. So why not measure on the values? So you will change your behavior to provide the values. In one particular organization, I came across a situation when they have the Scrum maturity assessment. Very much using the Scrum language. And I ended up in a situation when one team is Kanban. And I asked them what what and I asked the leadership, what are we supposed to do in that particular situation? The result is very interesting. The result is let's create one more for the Kanban. I said, OK, fine. What if the team is using both? Are we going to do two assessment in that case? What if the team is going to use the lean? Are we going to create a third assessment? What if the team is going to use a lean and Kanban? Are we going to use a new combination? Why not we are creating the matrix based on providing the value to the stakeholders, whatever the mechanics they are using, whatever the process they are using? whether they are using the Scrum or Kanban or Lean or XP or Scrum XP or any other combination of that. Otherwise, we will end up the Scrum assessment, the Kanban assessment, the Lean assessment, the Scrum XP assessment, and the story is going on. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah, I got, I got the uh, uh, overall. Uh, the, yes, I absolutely answered my question. Uh, Lakshmi, you may want to ask your question. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so my question is that when we are saying we are just giving the estimates, right, uh, for the stories, not the actual uh, timeline. So, uh, but uh, also we want to make sure that the work is getting completed within the uh, sprint uh, timelines. So should i am in a certain stage now that a uh, few of the developers are uh, not much mature like uh, every time they are not completing their stories so should we give a very strict due date to them or we can just say what they have given is a estimate and just let them work uh, on their own so how do we handle that a uh, very interesting question thanks for asking i am actually hearing something more interesting here that some developers are not doing this thing. So uh, let me ask you one question. Take a look at any team sports. Uh, take a look at, for example, the cricket. I know cricket is very popular in India. So is it possible that some players are saying we won the match and the rest of the players said we, we, lost, we lost the match? Either the whole team won the match or the whole team lost the match. It is a mutual accountability. So if we are in that particular mindset, 
that some people are doing the work and some people are not doing the work, then basically this dysfunction is we are not working as a team. So the estimation is not OK, I can do this thing in two hours or two story points or whatever the unit we are using. It is coming from the whole team. The whole team decided collectively that this is what we as a team think the effort is going to be. If we are not working that thing, then it is something very similar that the striker are blaming the defender and defenders are blaming the strikers. I use the proper example. Ballers are blaming the best man and best are blaming the ballers. They are saying, OK, we did our job, but we we lose because of you. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. I saw one more uh, raise hand. Raman? Yeah, Raman. Yeah, hi, Vijan. I think so. so I work for a pro, uh, like service based company. We have. So I'm from Tech Mahindra and our client is like uh, British Telecom. So basically in service based company, like uh, we work in like uh, Spotify model. So basically we work at nine spots together in a single drive. So here what happened is like uh, people from Tech Mahindra, uh, like whoever are working from Tech Mahindra, like whoever are there in the drive, reports to one manager. Okay. So here my question is like uh, who uh, are a scrum master uh, reportable to and another thing is in my squad I have a different PO and other squad uh, has a different PO and that PO is my reporting manager and whenever we have a collaborating call of Tech Mahindra she has always complaints on my squad that you people are not performing well and uh, so 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 go on. That goes on and then like when I take this up with my PO, he was like we are delivering the best in our total strike like among nine squads. We are the best delivering strike. OK, and and even the number speaks that. OK, but always my reporting manager has complaints on my squad. So how do I deal with this? Every uh, this happens. Uh, here. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to set the expectation that if we are not doing good, then uh, what do you expect us to do? So here, uh, I, I don't know the full context. Thanks for giving me the background, but it looks like that there is a different expectation and they are looking from the different lens. So one manager is looking from one lens and from that lens, this team is not putting the expectation and another manager is looking from the different lens. Uh, let's, I, I'm not saying that this is your situation, but just hypothetically, I'm just trying to create a situation when one manager is trying to look from the story point uh, or plan versus completed or something similar, and another manager is looking from the value to the stakeholders. So although from the one manager's point of view, you are meeting all the metrics, really good, plan versus completed is always more than 90%, uh, velocity is greater than X amount, and you are increasing the velocity air by air, everything is good, awesome. But from the another manager's point of view, customer is not happy. You are not providing the value to the customer. It is a buggy software. They are getting a lot of complaints from the customer. So this might be one possible situation. Uh, if that is the case, probably you have to set from uh, you have to ask the uh, manager to set the expectation uh, how we are being measured. Uh, you said we are not good. Then on what criteria you are actually measuring us? So we can check ourselves and we can adjust ourselves accordingly. Does it help? Yeah. So I have one more question here. Like uh, uh, always, this thing goes on be, uh, like uh, in between our squads, like uh, uh, my manager squad and my own squad. So like, uh, how should be a, a user story in this time? So is, like, should that be a very short one or should that be a big novel kind of thing explaining each and everything? Well, uh, main focus is not the story. Main focus is the sprint goal. The stories are actually planned to achieve the sprint goal. And at the end of the day, day, the commitment of the team is to achieve the sprint goal. And stories are actually planned to achieve the sprint goal. And plan might be changed depending on the circumstances. And I think in one of the setting or one of the writing, I mentioned something similar. Suppose you have the plan to play some game like soccer. 
and you come up with a plan based on the circumstances, based on the opponent's strength and weakness and your own strength and weakness. But during the match execution, some unexpected thing happened. You, your player might got injured, might got a red card, maybe something unexpected happened with your opponents. They might get injured or they might got red card. Are you still sticking with your original plan? Or are you going to modify your plan? Because your goal is to win the match. Your goal is not to stick with a plan. So the same thing is here. Your goal is to achieve the sprint goal. Your goal is not to make sure that either we are 100% on the plan or not. What if you are 100% on the plan but miss the sprint goal? What if, take a look at this way. What if the soccer teams have a plan to play with the opponent and they are sticking to the plan and they are doing exactly what they discussed at the beginning, 100% as per plan, but they still lose the match. Are they going to celebrate? Yes, we we did what, whatever we planned. So my main focus is the sprint goal. The stories, they can change and they should change if there is a new circumstances, new information, because if you are not changing, then it means it is no more transparent. Because now it is not showing the current reality. Does it help? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we are already four minutes past uh, and uh, I don't want to uh, keep Zisha and uh, uh, st uh, still in this session uh, because of the time zone differences. And uh, I think uh, it was a wonderful session and uh, you have uh, gracefully accepted uh, even in these odd hours and also uh, you have uh, imparted a very good uh, session. It was very helpful. Uh, I'm sure uh, all of us who have joined have learned uh, something or the other from this session. And as you rightly mentioned, the uh, focus should be on more uh, value delivery than on any of the uh, metrics. And uh, that was the, I think, need of the hour because most of us are uh, thinking from that perspective. And uh, that, again, when we talk about Agile and we uh, say a lot that it requires a mind, uh, mindset change or mindset shift. So this is, again, a shift that uh, we need to uh, bring in, uh, in uh, uh, for Scrum Masters and Agile coaches as well. So thank you so much, Zishan, for the wonderful session and uh, looking forward for more sessions uh, from you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vivek. Thank you, Ramya, uh, for inviting me and giving an opportunity to have so much, such a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, it everyone, was, for joining. It was a pleasure, Zishan, having you over here. And thank you for your session. All right. Thank you, Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.